You're listening to the Back Home Network, presented by Homefield Apparel. Welcome back to Crimson Cast. Galen Clavio joining you. Here it is Tuesday, August 20th, 11 days from the opening kickoff in Memorial Stadium and only like four days away from college football kicking off, which happens this upcoming weekend, I believe, as I think we've got like Florida State, Georgia Tech. That's going to bring them in ratings wise. But uh, but anyway, it's great to have college football back. And we are right in the thick of things. We've got our friend Taylor Lehman from Bite Size Bison joining us on the show. Taylor, great to see you. Happy birthday last week and uh, happy happy sports season. It, we we made it through the long pause and we're back again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Galen. Yeah, no, the um, I, I every every year since I've been. Well, I remember when I was in college and I covered uh, Indiana football, I always got so excited. I was more of a football guy than a basketball guy. And uh, just being up in the press box and covering games like that, it, the excitement around it was was awesome. And I still kind of get uh, similar feelings to to that when when the bat when the football season uh, approaches. So I'm really, really looking forward to it. Also, I feel like by size bison now is starting to kind of shape into what I was hoping it would, um, uh, when I first started. So I'm actually really excited for this football season and the new things that are, that are coming to the newsletter. If you haven't checked out bite size bison, please go do so folks. You can do it on Substack. You can follow Taylor on, on, uh, X or, or other sites and get links. To, you can also go to our Substack. And um, there's a link to Bite Size Bison from there. Uh, subscriptions available throughout the course of the year. And you're going to want this information about IU football. If you're watching this, you're clearly an IU football fan. Um, I think of what we do here at Crimson Cast is we try to describe the, the overarching questions about why. But Taylor's here to tell us how and what. And I think that that's a really important thing. And uh, it's certainly a resource I rely on on a regular basis to try to figure out what's going on with the team and what to be looking at as we go through uh, not just the preseason, but ultimately the season season. So what's the what's the special right now on Bite Size Bison? Uh, Let the folks know. (laughs) Uh, I'll. I will say there might be a, like a day before the season flash sale. Or like like the, the key, keep your eyes out for that that week before the few days before the season begins. There might be a flash sale. Right now, there's not really a deal by <laughs> size bison. Uh, but until then, uh, but I will say, um, I, I Galen, I've been sending you a lot of things. Yeah. Um, it's it's gonna look different than it has in in previous seasons if you've been yeah. following along for the last two seasons. So I'm. I, I think it'll be worth it. There's some great, some great data viz. Uh, there's some great charts. Yeah. There's some great utilization of data, and uh, there's some other cool things. If you go to Bite Size Bison right now, there's a pinned post how to maximize your Bite Size Bison subscription, uh, and there's going to be uh, full access to a chat where we can talk uh, as a collective about what's going on with IU football. You can comment on paid posts. You can participate in reader polls. You get access to all the free resources that are at Bite Size Bison, as well as all the newsletter posts. It's just, it's a really great deal. And you get a chance to learn about many of the things that we're going to talk about on this podcast, position battles and what's going on, uh, looking at what the roster looks like overall, figuring out what to be thinking of when you think about this IU team. And as the season goes along, understanding what's happening in the games from a statistical perspective, if you've been listening to this podcast for long enough, you know, we try to touch on, you know, what the implications from S&P Plus are and what we're seeing in games in terms of where IU is either excelling or struggling or just holding pat in terms of both their offensive and defensive efficiency. Taylor's going to go a lot deeper into that. So uh, go check out this and you'll be reading what I'm reading throughout the course of the season if you do so. So uh, I can I say real fast, Galen, I don't want to interrupt you, but thank you for all of that. And also uh, I appreciate how much you how much you and Scott um uh re- not only read by size bison, but like credit it when you when you mention uh things that, that you've read. Uh, I listened to Scott's interview with Zion Brown uh and and he mentioned by size bison a couple times. It's like, man, it's it's so nice the knowing that you guys read by size bison, the people who I respect so much um read well, my material. So thank you. 
well, not to turn this into like a mutual admiration society, <laughs> but you know, as we've often said, like we we want to see and hear things about IU football, and I think especially. You know, one of the problems, it, the problem is the wrong way of putting it, but one of the things to keep in mind about traditional media coverage uh, from reporters and and even from a lot of blogs is that, and even Pi, I think podcasts are maybe the biggest offender. It's, it's hard to get nuts and bolts type of coverage about, you know, the what and the how, the things that I was talking about earlier, like what is causing victories and, and defeats. Because, you know, historically in, in sports journalism, the focus has been on on stories regarding people or stories regarding institutions. And there's clearly that has a nice, broad appeal. We want to learn about the personalities and the backstories. It's not to say that there's not a place for those things, but there's also a need. And I think we've seen this across not just college football, but pro football and several other sports. There's a real appetite for the numbers. There's a real appetite for understanding, like, what's under the hood with football, and it's such a fascinating sport. It's such a, it's a it's fascinating to me because it's a sport a lot of people think is just kind of this dumb clash of physical beings, when in reality, it is this multi layered chess match every play. And there's like a thousand variables, and there's innovation, and there's uh, there's there's people falling out of favor. There's all kinds of different things. It's a fascinating subculture if you're into it. Not everybody is. And I think it's one of the things that we've tried to, to get across with Crimson Cast. Like, not for everybody, bite sized bison, maybe not for everybody. But if you want to understand how football works or you want to think about uh, the more of the strategic or tactical implications of some of the things that are going on and how that might differ from the Tom Allen era to the Kevin Wilson era to the Kurt Signetti era, this is these are the places to come for these things. So we appreciate you, Taylor. You know, we, we missed Punt John Punt still, and they kind of touched on this a bit. You've gone a lot deeper in some areas, uh, you know, and it's just great to have somebody in the space doing that. So my thanks to you for giving us something that we've been looking to read for a while. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, we are all here. Well, Taylor's kind of, uh, he's in the mix, uh, but we at the, at the Crimson Cast are part of the Back Home Network. And just a reminder, the Back Home Network is brought to you by Home Field Apparel, your place to go for the finest in college fashions, the softest fabrics, the coolest designs, the... Uh, just the never-ending cavalcade of great stuff that they produce. We talked about the boxes uh, that are being uh, pushed out right now. Uh, these kickoff uh, era boxes, where we're we're watching Home Field put amazing combinations of unique product hats and hoodies and T-shirts and koozies and different things. Uh, that are themed to your particular team. There's an Indiana box that's amazing. There's several boxes across the board uh, that if you're a fan of, if you're if you if you're an IU football fan, but you also root for I don't know Kansas State, or or I don't know if actually you know if Kansas State has a box, but they would probably you know they I think they probably have a box and like the ability to get cool gear that's going to make you feel like even more of a fan that's going to make you stand out at tailgates. That's what home field apparel can provide across the board. Go over to homefieldapparel.com, Use the code home 23, get 15% off your first order. And you'll be amazed at all the stuff that's in the store. If you haven't been there already. So go check them out uh, again, home field apparel, proud sponsor of the back home network. Also, as I mentioned on the last show, we have a new sponsor and it is who's your game day logger brought to you by the Upland Brewing Company, Hoosier Game Day Lager, the official craft beer of IU Athletics, embodying Hoosier pride in every can, featuring the iconic cream and crimson candy stripes. Hoosier Game Day Lager is a classically smooth and refreshing beer, a Vienna lager, uh, not your typical lightweight adjunct lager that you're used to seeing pour from particular types of domestic taps. No, this is this is a full flavored, multi malted. Uh, beer that uh, has ingredients that come right here from the state of Indiana. And it's a great companion for cheering in Memorial Stadium or enjoying it at your tailgate spot or just enjoying it at home or out in Bloomington at one of the great establishments we have that serves Hoosier Game Day Lager. You can find Hoosier Game Day Lager at those establishments at any of Upland's nine family family locations and everywhere Upland beers are sold. Again, Upland Brewing Company reminds you to drink responsibly. Go Hoosiers. So let's dive in. We wanted to talk, obviously, if you haven't yet, folks, go listen to 
Scott and Zion talking. Uh, I have actually, Taylor's ahead of me. I haven't had a chance to actually listen to that podcast yet, but we're really trying to ramp up the content and get more information about what's going on with this football program out to you. Uh, before we got, dive into some positional discussion, one thing I wanted to touch on, the vibe around camp so far. And, and what we're seeing in the daily coverage and what we've heard from Kurt Signetti and his staff, um, like what has stuck out to you so far just in terms of, of what we've been seeing coming out in the press and the words that we've been hearing from the coaching staff so far or the players for that matter? Um, you know, I think just the uh... – well, uh, the biggest thing that jumps out is the is was uh, the particular Omar Cooper uh, quote that came out that several <laughs> people uh, sent me <laughs> about the uh, change in vibe of practice and, and the speed um, and intensity of practice between uh, Signetti and and Allen and um, just to and, just to and, make know, sure I think make sure everybody's on the same page yeah. with the quote. I'll just quote yes. this. This is from the the HT piece. And this is from Omar Cooper Jr., uh, IU wide receiver. I love Coach Allen, but last year he wasn't as hard on us and yelling at us to pick up the tempo and stuff. The fast-paced practice was a little slower. That was a little different. And and we've heard kind of different variations of this same theme over the course of not just summer, but also spring. There does really feel like the players are acknowledging there's a much different vibe here than what we were used to before. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think you know that's uh, it, it. You know, I feel like it shows us a lot about the the position that the program is in and has been in for the last you know year or two, um, and, and and that you know the the position that Tom Allen was in as, as head coach last year in in twenty twenty three and um, and how Signetti has come in and and these these are common you know these are these are common uh, quotes from players who are carryovers from a previous administration into a new one. Um, and that there's always some sort of uh, increased intensity, uh, especially if it is um, a, a, a program that that let go of the coach. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, it, it. I mean, the things that I've heard, it's, they sound good. You know, obviously there are some some injuries that you know are a little concerning. You don't hope are lingering, but um, but yeah, from from that from that specific quote, um, I think you can take away you know, quite a bit from that one. Yeah. Um, obviously the news hasn't all been positive. There was a, an unfortunate uh, season ending injury that happened. And uh, what well, talk a little bit about that maybe to start with, since that is a positional thing, obviously. Um, but you know, that's, that's a real problem for IU and at a position that they really can't afford a whole lot more problems at. Yeah, yeah, Nick Kidwell, the the transfer from uh, James Madison, who missed most of last season uh, because of injury as well, and you know he in twenty twenty two he was he was good. He was one of their tackles and uh, performed well. Um, and in his last season, he was you know pretty like you know average amongst FBS uh, offensive linemen and and uh, passing grade, which was going to be very significant to this offensive line. And um, then losing him to a season ending injury is, is tough. Um, I'm sure he'll probably get some sort of a hardship waiver that will make him available for next season, which could be helpful. Um, but his eighth, his eighth year in college, yeah, his eighth year yeah. in college football. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's why, which means he was being recruited, I think during the Obama administration initially, <laughs> perhaps. <But> that, <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but no, yeah. it's so it, yeah, yeah, it's tough. It, it's tough, and um, we'll talk about that a little bit. But but I mean, overall, yeah. it does feel like uh, there's been a lot of positive uh, of talk coming out of of camp. Uh, a lot of the assistant coaches seem to be talking very positively about things. Obviously, things I think are still going to be kept somewhat close to the vest, just in terms of how things are going. It does appear that like Curtis Rourke is clearly establishing himself as the number one QB, which I think everybody expected would be the case. And, you know, we're close enough now that, you know, the whatever words that we're trying to parse from camp become less and less important because soon we'll just see the product on the field. And that's an, that's always a good spot to be in, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm 
kind of uh i think zion said this in, in the podcast kind of in wait and see mode now you know like we're, we're close enough to where you know as long as we don't have any more uh nick kidwell <laughs> situations um you know we are getting uh indiana is getting what it's getting from Kurt Signetti and, and this turned over you know program so as far as staff and roster so it, it's um it'll be interesting to see what week one looks like and, and it's coming i mean I mean, August is flying by, so so uh, it's it's um, yeah. It, but yeah, I mean, nothing nothing too uh, unusual or unexpected uh, coming out of coming out of the out of camp. Uh, the he was I will say Signetti was pretty honest about Taven Jackson and, and kind of where he's at in relation to Curtis Rourke, which was uh, honestly refreshing. <laughs> so um, you know, he hasn't named him uh, starter yet, but. I think that's more out of respect for Taven and and the position that he held before Signetti and, and everybody else got here. So, um, but yeah, I would expect Curtis Rourke to start there. So let's dive into some of the positions more gen or more specifically, I guess, as we go through this. I mean, so you know, it, it maybe this this should start with where we have been up to this point in terms of thinking about the different roles that are going to be filled by players and how those roles coalesce within the position groups. And, uh, you know, maybe we start off with a question I know we've gotten from a lot of our, our Twitter followers, and we've gotten these questions as well on the Discord. You know, what are the positions in your mind that are going to be the most foundational to success or failure this year for IU? I mean, if you had to rank order them, maybe the top three, and then like what does it look like right now as far as each of those positions? So I'll, I'll let you start there. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I would probably discount quarterback from this because obviously, but, uh, but the, the top three, um, I would say, well, especially now, number one is probably offensive line, um, and particularly interior offensive line. I, I think a lot of folks, including myself are kind of chalking up, uh, the tackles to be kind of, um, automatic like like automatically productive with trey wedig and carter smith i think there's something to prove there too i think that's not necessarily as guaranteed as it might feel um but but that offensive line and 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 you know replacing uh nick kidwell when you really only had one true guard in the first place is going to be difficult um because left guard was looking like tyler stevens and i'm not really sold on tyler stevens um and so, you know, the the trio of uh, Stevens and Bray Lynch and Drew Evans is going to be the interior or the guards, and obviously Mike Hadick at uh, center. So, you know, I mean, the guards are just going to really have to step up and, and, and play well. But, um, you know, I think if there is any, any sort of like deterioration along the offensive line, I think the staff has already proven that it can and, and, and might lean on its passing game even more so than it did in the past. Um, so I think, uh, you know, offensive line, number one, defensive line, number two, and with, and with defensive line, I think, you know, um, there's been some positive talk about Mikhail Kamara coming out of camp. Um, I kind of want to see it for myself personally. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, uh, Jacob Mango Farrar making the transfer to stud, I think is, uh, is, is, is also a question mark. The, the center of the defensive line, I think is, is, is good. I think James Carpenter and CJ West are about as, um, guaranteed as anything else along that defensive line. So, uh, yeah, so the, I guess the interior offensive line, the exterior defensive line is, is, is the biggest concern for those for honestly, for the entire roster. Yeah. Uh, but then number three, um, I think you go se several different directions with this, obviously wide receivers, but um, I mean, I would just say the entire defensive backfield, probably, uh, probably cornerbacks, honestly. Um, I think, I think a lot of guys are really going to have to step up there. Nick Toomer got moved back to cornerback and, and it's pretty, it's pretty thin there. Uh, D'Angelo Pons, you know, he's, he's, he, I mean, he is, he showed what he is at James Madison and he's gotten positive, um, positive uh support from signetti coming out of summer camp or fall camp but um you know the, i i i'm also kind of a wait and see mode with d'angelo ponds just making that jump uh being a true sophomore um i kind of want to see it and as far as the second spot goes i mean jamari sharp was not super impressive last year um 
And even though he did play a lot, Jameer Johnson was hurt. I think he could be okay. Uh, but Nick Toomer might end up being that second cornerback, uh, which might say something for the rest of the room since he was playing with safeties not long ago. So, um, yeah. Now, it, it, there's an interesting aspect to a lot of the, p- the projections of these folks that I think is important to keep in mind. And, I, and it's something that dovetails with some of what I've been seeing out of the individual assistants and the way that uh, there's been some discussion from the players about the way the practices are being conducted. I mean, th- this is always the tough part about projections because all we have to rely on is the film and the statistics that were generated in the previous year or previous couple of years. And there's two different sources of uncertainty with this right now. There is the uncertainty of what's been talked about a lot, the transition of the JMU players up to this level. And the fact that, well, they produced really well at that level, but that's that level. That's the Sun Belt. Um, You know, it's not, it's not the level of, of where you're at here, does that translate to the Big Ten? I've not been that concerned about that because I, I do feel like with proper coaching and technique, there's not actually that much of a delineation, at least between the middle of the Big Ten and what you'll find there. It's really the upper stages where that becomes a bigger issue. But the other question becomes, of the players that were here the previous few years, when Indiana went 9-27 and 27 over three seasons, how much more can they produce with a different coaching approach, uh, a different schematic approach? You know, do, do we accept that their productivity levels have a natural cap in terms of how much they might improve just from a year-to-year basis? Or are there some untapped potentials with the roster holdovers that might actually significantly elevate because they have some superior athletic talent to now go along with some superior coaching approaches? Yeah, no, that's... I- that's a great question. And, uh, you know, some, some guys that come to mind when I think about that are like Josh Sanguinetti, um, who is, I mean, I, I think he's probably the favorite to be free safety just based off of, um, uh, skill sets within that room and, and, and his experience and, and the fact that they did bring him back, which I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, expecting that. I, I will, I haven't been too impressed by Josh Sanguinetti. So can, yeah, like you were asking, can, you know, a change in, um, a change in staff, a change in approach. Can that, you know, can that change things for Josh Sanguinetti? Um, and and, you know, there, there are others as well, but, uh, I think, you know, somebody that you can probably point to and be like, you know, there's a possibility for that is Mike Kadick and, and the way that he has improved after, uh, Bob Bostad came to town after, um, Darren Hiller. So, you know, those are two different examples. So um, you're right. And and I, the, my approach to this is that, especially when we're talking about like the, uh, there are so many players in this roster who are making the jump from some lower level up into the big 10. And my approach is that some guys are going to hit and some guys are not. And we don't really know who those are. Uh, I don't even know if the coaches know who those are because a lot of the coaches haven't coached in the big 10. And right. so, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I, I obviously nobody has the answer to that question. Oh. And I guess that's the point that I'm trying to make. Yeah, no. And it's, and I, then I didn't ask it with the idea that you had the answer. If you did, yeah, yeah. we would have, we would have stopped the podcast and we would have gone into business together uh, right. because that would have been great. Uh, but no, I, I look at it like this. Um, it, there's a, you have to give, I think a new staff that's had the success that this staff has had at taking you know, talent at the level that they took it and turning it so quickly into a group that could work together. Because it's not just about individual skills. It's also about the schematic structure of either the offense or the defense or the blocking scheme as it relates to the offense. I mean, a lot of a lot of the problems last year with the offensive line might have been addressed through a different scheme or a different approach. And many people whose memories last longer than maybe a month will remember that like there was a lot of consternation about IU's approach on offense last year that led to, you know, the, a, a change in, in coaching leadership because <laughs> it was like, why are, why is IU trying to do something that they clearly don't have the personnel to do? And when you do that, you end up putting your players in a position where they look significantly worse 
than they actually are because they are being asked to do things that they can't do, or they're being asked to support things that they can't effectively work with. And so you end up with this, and then that leads to confidence issues, which leads to more performance issues. And then the whole thing spirals. And it's why it's so easy. I always think about, you think about an NFL team, like most NFL teams are pretty close to each other in terms of actual talent level, but it's the scheme, it's the approach, it's the way that players are asked to do certain things. And you can tell when a team, a team can be really good one year, can make the playoffs, can, you know, can, can win a game in the playoffs. And then the next year they're, they're seven and 10 or they're six and 11. And it's like, well, what the hell happened? Like the personnel was essentially the same. Did the players all get worse? And most of the time, no, most of the time, what happened was either you had players in the wrong spots doing things that they couldn't do, or you had a scheme that didn't match what the players could do. And that's a common issue. It's why coaching is so difficult because that, that, that alchemy changes every year and you have to adapt it. And and so I, I just think with this, it's such a fascinating mix. And, you know, the more I see rankings of, you know, people get upset about IU was ranked 83rd or 84th in in college football. And it's like, well, you are relying on, as we've talked about before on the show, you're relying on whatever data is in front of you. And we know that if you just take the productivity at JMU, if you take the productivity of the players that were at IU and you lop them together and you put, well, here's the schedule and here's what we think, but it's not accounting for what is likely to be a, a seismic shift in philosophy on both sides of the ball about how all this stuff conducts. And so it's where, it, you know, you look at some of the names you mentioned, like in the in the defensive backfield, and it's hard to say how that will actually translate to this level with that position group. And also who might emerge because they're being asked to do things that perhaps are closer to their skill set. That is something that I'm really fascinated by. And what I'll say, Galen, too, uh, and, and when they changed offensive coordinators uh, last season, um, I, I created a, a draft of like a cumulative EPA of, you know, estimated points added per play and, and plotted it for the last five seasons and offensive EPA pretty much right when Rod Carey took over started to increase. It was decreasing and then it began to increase um, and it ended up finishing, you know, by a substantial margin third of, of the last five seasons behind 2019 and 2020. And, uh, and it was headed the same, you know, direction as 21 and 22. But like you were saying, the, the scheme can really transcend a lot of, uh, um, on a lot of talent because of what Signetti has already said in the past, uh, the spring, which is that, you know, he's planning and he's, you know, preparing his staff to create a scheme that works with the the players that they have. And so that's always been promising to me as far as, you know, if, if they don't have the most talent, um, which, which, I mean, they don't because Ohio state and Michigan are also in this conference, but they, they can put them in the right places, like you were saying. Right. And so, you know, you end up you, you end up saying the same things that you've been saying for months because there hasn't been any football played, right. but yeah. the, the, it is it is what it is, you know. And so that's something to keep in mind um, that might have been forgotten in the spring, I guess. And, and I'd, I'd like that you brought that up. What um, when you think about other position groups that are in the mix here? I mean, you've got obviously there's certain things we feel. And, and I, the one last thing I'll say about the previous point, I didn't want to forget this before I move to this next point. I, there is a difference, I think, in, in terms of there are certain position groups where there's only so much that scheme and coaching can do. At the end of the day, it's really about the raw materials, in this case being the players and what their physicality is. So offensive line, has this has always been the biggest issue for IU, is that it's been very hard for them except in the Kevin Wilson era, to recruit the right types of offensive line recruits who can play at the Big Ten level. And I think it's one of the things that Wilson didn't get enough credit for was how quickly they turned that around and got like yeah. multiple like NFL caliber offensive linemen playing at IU, which we didn't yeah. I mean, in the previous 15 years. He's like, is that even possible? <laughs> um, you know, but so you know, I do think that that kind of a thing is interesting. Now, you know, with wide receiver, with with the defensive backfield, with a couple of other position groups, I do think that as long as you've got some core physical skills, but you may not have the perfect prototype. You may not have a receiver room full of six, four guys with, you know, Velcro hands, but you can make do with assets that work in ways that 
are best utilized in a clever manner where it's like, we're going to take this person's best aspects and use them for that and not ask them to do things that they can't do. And that is, so that's the one other thing. And it's where I, I'm curious with your, because you mentioned the difference between the interior defensive line where physic, I think the physical nature of the players is probably the most important versus your, your edge players on the defensive line. Do you feel like that's something that you can get around a little bit, even if you don't have like maybe top end pass rushing talent? Uh, you know, if can you get around it from a physicality perspective by doing some different things scheme wise with the exterior defensive line that maybe you couldn't get away with with the offensive line? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, th- I think so. I think um, if you, you know, can't, please tell me because I don't want to get. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, yeah, right, right. No, I think I think defensive end is a little bit more of a struggle. Uh, you can teach technique, and but at the end of the day, there's a reason why these like big Chase Youngs go to Ohio State and stuff. Um, you know, I, I think I, but I will say that um, there have been uh, there have been so uh, I I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Uh, Jamry Chroma, I think was his name. Uh, who was a, a defensive end for James Madison last year, but he was at Rutgers and then he transferred to James Madison. Obviously that's moving down a level, but he became incredibly productive. And, and, um, and with this, uh, with, you know, Pat Koontz as his defensive line coach. And obviously you have Buda Williams coaching them now, but uh, you know, those guys are paid a lot of money. Like Pat Koontz and Boodoo Williams are paid a lot of money and, and they're both handling the defensive line. And so there is a lot of attention being given to that, that, that position group. And so, you know, they, you know, they, they have a, a lot of, you know, great talent on the defensive. I'm, I'm not trying to take anything away from the defensive line, but, mm-hmm. but there's uh there is a lot more talent elsewhere and so that's why you pay the coaches a lot of money to, to, to get that technique to where it needs to be. But yes, as far as scheme goes, you can scheme um, as far as, as far as I understand Brian Haynes's defensive philosophy is that they are playing to attack from the center of the defensive line. And so if you can coach those guys to really attack and, and cause havoc, um, then that maybe takes some pressure off of the defensive ends to use their physical, you know, uh, capabilities to get around tackles. Um, but I will say defensive end is, is pretty predicated on, on physical skill set uh, a, as well. So, but I, I don't think it's out of yeah. the, out I mean, of, you know, the realm of possibility. Let, so anyway, going to the question that I was originally asking oh, yeah. you before I just <laughs> down that unnecessary side pathway. So what, where do you feel like the biggest variance is in the position groups? Like the kind of the, the Delta between, what a bad year and a good year would be just based upon a lack of understanding of what Indiana's got to deal with. Um, could you ask that question again? Gail? Sorry. What, what position? I'm sorry. I, I phrased it terribly. What positions do you feel like there's the greatest uncertainty in terms of this could be an amazing position group, or this could be a position group that actually ends up not being very amazing at all, but we're just not yeah. totally sure because of the players and we don't know how they're going to actually work when the rubber hits the road. Yeah, I'll start with safety. Um, safety, the safety has a lot of talent and it has a lot of guys that fit a strong safety build, which is interesting. Um, there are not a lot of guys that fit a free safety build, and which makes me think that they are looking to rotate a lot of safeties this year um, until somebody you know steps up and takes the job. I think right now the only safety that I can really think of, well, between the rover spot and then strong safety and free safety is uh, Sean Asbury. I would assume that he's probably starting a strong safety. Um, he looked really good in the spring game and we've only heard really good things about him. And so um, I think he's uh, he he's he's probably pretty solid. But after him, I don't think there's really anything certain, uh, at least from, from any outsider's perspective, about who is playing the other positions. And, you know, when, when you watch James Madison play, they, they essentially just play with three safeties. And so... Um, you know, if that room doesn't step up, that's a, that's a lot of uh, real estate to be surrendering on the, on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, like we kind of saw in the past, you know, the Husky Husky never really after Marcelino ball um, never really was super productive and that kind of cost the defense. And that's just one player. So, you know, 
Yeah, I think safety is one where if they don't step up, it could really be costly. Um, I would also say, uh, I would also say wide receivers and and like the wide receivers, the passing game has to be good this year. And and six of six of the wide receivers are leaving. Curtis Rourke is leaving uh, after the season, uh, and barring any injuries that would result them in using their redshirt season because a lot of them do have the red shirts available. Um, there aren't going to be a lot of these guys left over. And so right. how do you build a passing attack out of them? And can they all step up? Um, uh, probably one of my um, most unpopular opinions amongst the uh, IU football fans is that I I'm, I'm slow to be as hyped about Donovan McCauley as a lot of others are. I think he's going to serve a very particular role on the perimeter and especially in the red zone, but that is somebody who made the transition from quarterback to wide receiver, even though he did flash a lot of potential, um and and like real physical gifts that guy is amazing um he is also extremely unexperienced compared to a lot of the other other receivers in this room so you know when you look at the skill sets and and how you can build a passing attack out of this uh wide receiver room and also tight ends and running backs there's a lot of guys to get the ball to and you know donovan mccauley is gonna have to separate himself as somebody who can play uh similarly to like an elijah sarai even though they'll be playing two different roles in this passing attack but he's gonna have to show that he can do more than what he's done in the past which is mostly um perimeter play (laughs) and and so but you know yes that's just one example so i think that there are a lot of guys in that wide receiver room that can really step up but will they um, and if they don't, then that's going to really hurt the offense. So I would say those two positions come to mind first. Are um, I mean, what do you? What would you anticipate? Well, you and I were having this conversation in terms of like uh, looking at advanced statistics when it comes to receiving core. And I mean, the Allen era kind of devolved into a thing where the only people that were regularly catching passes were, were wide receivers. <laughs> uh, the tight ends weren't being used the way that they had been, like when Kalen DeBoer was here, or even before that. Um, I know you've touched on this a little bit, but when we think about receiving and, and just the, 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 the passing game in general, are you based upon what we've seen out of, um, out of Shanahan and Sanceri in the past, are you expecting a, a more wide ranging approach to who gets the ball thrown to them? And does that even out maybe some of the uncertainties in terms of who in the wide receiver room will necessarily need to step up? I mean, there's a lot of receivers here and it's just, it's going to be interesting kind of watching that, that combination play into the mix. If they're also going to use tight ends and running backs in the process as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I think it will be more wide range. I think it will be a lot more balanced. I think a lot of the different, um, offensive packages you'll see are, are probably, probably, they'll probably still involve tight ends, obviously at, I think tight, I'm a big tight ends guy. So I think tight ends will uh, will definitely be involved, especially Zach Horton and Trey Walker, I think, as well. Um, but when you look at uh, Galen, I, I sent you this uh, as a, a draft of something that I'll be putting out each week. But it, when you look at the uh, pass catchers, everybody on this roster, the pass catchers EPA per target last season. So estimated points added per target. Um, Kalen Black uh actually had a pretty high value when when compared to all the all the other running backs he is like significantly higher just because he's really explosive and he's effective in the passing game but james madison did not have a very good offensive line last year so it was necessary um just to give him the ball so that is something that he can do it's something that justice ellison doesn't do super well um and tyson lawton does a little bit but um but kalen black getting involved in the passing game so you know it's kind of a, 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 a spoil of riches when you look at each individual pass catcher, but then how do they mesh together in, in, in a single passing game, I think will be be interesting to watch. Um, at this point, I kind of forgot what your question was. but, no, but no, I, I, you Largely answer, I mean, the Kalen Black thing's an interesting one because, again, it's like you look at the – you look at the players that you, I mean, you've got, you think about it, you've got Donovan McCulley, you've got Omar Cooper Jr., you've got Elijah Surratt, you've got Miles Cross, you've got EJ Williams, who's still on the roster. You've got Trey Walker, uh, at, you know, at, and James Bomba's in the mix. Uh, there's there's a bunch of different options. And and I guess where I'm, where I'm going with this is as we think about the conceptualization of how good the wide receiver room might be and, and what that will mean for the overall offensive health of this program you know what i'll note is like if you look at last year's statistics of the top six 
pass catchers in uh, for IU for the course of the season. The top five were all wide receivers. You know, McCulley had uh, you know, caught 48 balls, Dequeez Carter, Cam Camper, E.J. Williams, Omar Cooper. Jalen Lucas, who wasn't really a running back, uh, you know, he was like a specialist. Um, he he caught 34 balls, but only for 7.2 yards per catch. And then, like, the highest if – you, if you take Jalen Lucas out of the mix, Josh Henderson – catches eight or 10 balls through eight games and Trey Walker catches 10 balls through 11 games and uh, everybody else, like there wasn't another Trent Howland caught three balls. Christian Turner caught four balls for a combined zero yards. And, and, you know, the idea is ultimately, you know, when you put that much pressure on the wide receivers to do all of the catching it, especially if you don't have a running game to really back it up and, and uh, you know, if you're not playing in that style, it just leads to a different set of expectations of what you might get. And, I mean, obviously Indiana's offense was very sick last year. Even in their running backs, the, the leading rusher for the entire season had 354 yards on 75 carries. Like, it was, it was, it was grim. Uh, that, that's where I'm thinking with this as we try to anticipate with the wide receiver group how will they do? What will that room look like at the end of the day? It almost becomes kind of a survival of of the the top players thing there because if you're able to spread the ball out a little bit more, you really have to do well when you're out there as a wide receiver to continue to get the repetitions. And that might lead to internal competition among that group for who even gets those reps in the first place if they aren't just having to be out there every time because they're the only ones that can catch balls. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, it, it does. It does. Um, and when I was, uh, I, I wrote, I wrote it somewhere and I, I can't find it anymore, but the, when you looked at, uh, and, and the, and obviously they haven't had this sort of tight end talent since AJ Barner left, but when, when you look at the best offenses at Indiana in, in, in recent years, they got the tight ends involved in, in the passing game, especially in 2019 with Hendershot and, uh, you know, and and I, I think that's um, you, like obviously there isn't a whole lot. There hasn't been a whole lot of tight end talent, but at the same time, you have you have to get them involved. Like they have to be involved. And and if you don't have those pass catchers, like you were saying, um, you know, it, it really flattens your passing schemes. And and like when when you have somebody like a Kalen Black who can catch out of the backfield, you know, that that's just one more thing they the defense has to account for. And so when you and and I will say too, slot receiver really is a huge improvement on this right. roster. Yeah. It, it go on. I'd like to hear more. Yeah, the lot failure was the last real true slot re- I mean DJ Matthews but he could never stay healthy. And so, you know, lot failure was the last true slot receiver they had in 2020. And so having a slot receiver especially two of the caliber of Miles Price and Keshawn Williams, I mean that's that's huge and and just the the security blanket that those two guys have already provided for previous quarterbacks and and Curtis Rourke um, you know, being you know fairly new to the system and to the program, I think those two guys are going to be huge, and uh, what they can do. But yeah, I mean, I, I think yeah, you're you're right, Galen. I'm just adding to what you're saying. No, it's fine. Uh, it's interesting. Um, can you name the last season that IU had a player catch fifty or more balls, and who that player was? Fifty or more. <laughs> Uh, well, it had to be Watt Fillier. It was Watt Fillier. It was Watt Fillier, and I mean, probably 2019. So, is that so? He actually caught 54 in 2020, which which 2020. I, I feel like doesn't get as much because that was over eight games, which is nuts. Oh, and wow, yeah. <laughs> over, over 12 games last year, Donovan McCulley was the leading receiver and only caught 48 balls. <laughs> um, and but what's fascinating is you go back to 2019. Which the you know the one year Kalen DeBoer is the OC here, Wap Fillier caught seventy balls for one thousand and two yards, and Peyton Hendershot caught fifty two balls for six hundred and twenty two yards. And I remember you and I having conversations that year about how that relatively unexpected sudden leveraging of the tight end position just opened up so many more opportunities 
for uh, receivers. It was it wasn't just Fillier who was getting all of those slot cat you know receptions, but it was also Ty Freifogel and Nick Westbrook that year were also getting opportunities. Donovan Hale caught twenty two balls that year. Uh, you know, I mean, which I mean, if I'd asked you that, I, I, you I, you wouldn't have been able to name that off the top of your head. But yeah. I, I, the reason I bring that up is this new offensive staff coming in. You know, I'm I'm not going to assume that you'll see Indiana step up offensively the way they did between the uh, the end of the Mike DeBoer era at the conclusion of the 2018 season and the sole year for Kalen DeBoer. But I'll note going in go, coming out of 2018. The top seven pass catchers for IU were all receivers. It was it was Westbrook, Hale, Luke Timian, Fry Fogel, Jason Harris, Wap Fillier, and then Reese Taylor. Uh, there's a blast from the past. <laughs> uh, that was your top seven pass catchers. Uh, you had to go like Peyton Hendershot as a freshman was eighth on that list, and no no running backs, no tight ends. It was all receivers, and I'll I, I'll gonna throw Reese Taylor in there as essentially a quasi receiver. Um, and then you go to the next year, and Hendershot catches 52 balls, second on the team. Stevie Scott catches uh, 26 balls, and he's uh, sixth on the team. That year, Indiana accrued 3,931 yards in the passing game, uh, which was – I know, it's, it's – it's, I used to dream of times like these. That was 302 <laughs> yards a game. The following year, it was 250 a game. The following year – 2021 it was 175 it was 217 two years ago it was 212 last year so when i look at that gap I, you know i look at that that basically 75 to 80 yards a game gap i think a lot about this the talent in this receiving room physical talent in terms of donovan mcculley experience in terms of Surratt. uh you know obviously omar cooper looks like a guy who could really you know i mean he only caught 18 balls last year as a freshman but he was second on the team in yards per reception at 14.83. And I think he was, you know, he was a little bit low in yards per game, but he only played nine games. Gail, can I add to the Omar Cooper thing real fast before you yeah. move on? He was second among all the rece- or all the pass catchers on the current roster. He was second in EPA per target, just behind Donovan McCauley. Right. Like, that- he was really good. And so when I look at that, and I look at the potential of having an improved uh, tight end and running back pass catching aspect. I look at that as a rising tide that can lift all boats, including the rest of the boats in the receiver room, because that like, having to account for a tight end coming over the middle or planting, you know, seven yards downfield or having to account for a running back kind of coming out of the backfield as a pass catching threat causes the defense to not be able to just play standard coverage against the receivers, which opens up opportunities for them as well. This was what we argued for most of last year. It's like, why is Indiana trying to turn into a an option team or a team that's just running the ball? This makes no sense because, you know, there were different versions of this talent on the roster as well. And so not to relitigate last year, but the point is, as we think about the wide receiver room, it's not just about here's what the receivers did last year. I think it's important to keep that context and think about what might get added to the mix, given that we've got this new philosophy and this new coaching staff. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, the big joke last year between you and I was that I was a huge Dequeese Carter fan and he <laughs> never got used until like the second half, second third of the season or the last third of the season. And, uh, and, but it looked great. And it was because it added another, another dynamic to the passing game. And so you have a lot of guys that can do things like that. Miles Cross is, is like, I think he could be a game changer. Like yeah. just, I don't know, man, there's just so much talent in this wide receivers room. Um, I, yeah. It's almost, he's almost guaranteed to hit, but I don't you know. No, it's true. And look again, and it's philosophical differences, but I, you know, if you, if you want to look at three seasons that could point towards a, a present and a future, where Indiana is a lot more adept at using the passing game. Look at the last two years that Kevin Wilson was here and look at the one year that Kalen DeBoer was here. I just ran through the DeBoer numbers, but in the the in the second to last year Wilson was here, the pinstripe bowl year, Indiana had three guys who caught 54 or more balls, had a guy who went for 1,035 yards. Who was that? Do you remember? The guy, what, what season was it, 2016? 2015. 2015. 2015? That would have been... Uh... Ah, uh, shoot! That wasn't Nick Westbrook, was it? Nope. <laughs> no, 
Oh man. Oh, who? Oh, I'm gonna kick myself. It, it's fine. It's Simi Cobbs. Was was? Oh uh, yeah. Simi Cobbs. What? Sixty catches, one hundred and thirty or thousand thirty five yards. And Ricky Jones, fifty four <laughs> catches, nine hundred and six yards. That year, going back to that number we were talking about, trying to get around three hundred yards per game receiving. Indiana was at two ninety three point eight that year. Mm-hmm. And then in the final year for Wilson, Indiana was at two seventy three point eight, a little bit lower. But Nick Westbrook caught 54 balls. Ricky Jones caught 53 and Mitchell page caught 58. Uh, you know, it is possible to by choice use the passing game in a way where it's a primary methodology of moving the football. And, you know, even in years like that, when Indiana had a much better offensive line than they've probably enjoyed overall the last few years, they were using the passing game in a much more modern style. And I think that that to me, when I think about not just the receiving room, but also Curtis Rourke and how Indiana is going to approach that side of, of play, that opens up. And I think it actually makes the offensive line's job easier because your you're running run blocking is a lot there's, – there's a lot more physical impact on run blocking because you don't have the added – factor of being able to get the ball out of the pocket quickly and throwing the ball you have to hand the ball off so there's just some basic like physical philosophical differences in how these things operate so we'll see i could just we could be sitting here at the end of september and being like well that was we really talked ourselves into that one didn't we but i i'm choosing to be optimistic on this and i am really actually very excited about wide receiver but we talk about all this because there is this big delta between we don't know what it could we know what it could be but we don't know what it will be because there's a bunch of factors we're still waiting to actually get a final read on before we can say for sure how Indiana is going to conduct themselves yeah that's a great way to put it Galen we know what it could be but we don't know what it will be um the yeah and I, another note that I'll make about the the difference between run blocking and pass blocking is run blocking does depend quite a bit on talent and physical skill set and that's why a lot of teams that don't have the most talent along the offensive line can't really run the ball as well especially in the big 10 with those d- d- defensive lines but um pass blocking is a lot more a lot he- a lot more heavy on the uh, technique and yeah. so if you can teach technique uh especially a tackle which you know seems in a, to be in a good spot right now um you know that's uh it's just always seemed like they were building this offense to be a pass first offense and so yeah they oh. i think you, what everything that you, every note that you were making about the the different layers of of a passing scheme, I think that's like on point. I think that's what's that's really what stands out the most. And I even wrote it in the recap for the spring game. I was watching Trey Walker run out of a trip set yes. on the outside and running a mesh concept. I was like, what is happening right now, <laughs> Trey Walker? And, but yeah, no, like it looked great, and he caught the pass, and he looked. I mean. It was it was it was awesome, and and that was the most encouraging thing coming out of that spring spring game for me. It was just like how different the offense looked philosophically, and how refreshing that was to see after seeing you know Kalen DeBoer in 2019, and then you know even Kevin Wilson before that. Let me let's finish off because I don't want to go much longer than than an hour. Uh, let's talk just a little about special teams. Uh, because that ends up always being at least a, a deciding factor. It feels like in one or two games every year, either for or against IU, who can who could forget Indiana winning at Michigan State for the first time in forever because Michigan State couldn't kick the ball at the end of the of regulation. Um, what would you anticipate there? Is Indiana in good shape as far as the different areas of special teams? Are there areas that are concerning to you? What's your overall read right now on that? Yeah, I, I think I think it's um I mean as far as like kicking goes, I think that I think they're gonna be good in a good spot. They have James Evans again in his last season. Um I think he's set to be one of the best punters in the nation, honestly. Um it, as long as he can kind of increase his uh uh precision. I think that's the that's that's the thing that you know, can he get more balls down inside the 10, 20 yard line uh, versus can he, you know, really kick the ball far, which he had to do last season because the offense was in such rough shape. But yes, I think James Evans is good. Um, and then I think Derek McCormick, I think uh, Signetti said that Derek McCormick is their kickoff special, or is their kickoff kicker, Not maybe not a specialist, but is competing for um, field goals. I think he'll probably end up winning that one. Um yeah, I think he'll probably end up winning the the, the field goal competition. Um, he was pretty solid uh, last season, so I um, I think they're in a good spot with with kicking. 
uh, much better than they were last year. And then as far as like returning goes, I think um, they have three guys who can really return the ball as long as Solomon Van Horst can, uh, can stay healthy. I think, but Solomon Van Horst, he graded um, fifth in the FCS and kickoff returns in 2021. You know, <laughs> it was a long time ago. It was right. three seasons ago, but like, it's uh, it's notable. He, the the talent is there. He's a really dangerous guy, especially on kickoffs. Um, it, as long as he can stay healthy, and so it, you know, if that's the only thing he's required to do at Indiana, I he could pull it off. And as far as you know, punt returns go, uh, I think Miles Price is probably the number one guy there. He did pretty well at Texas Tech with that, um, and he has a lot of experience doing it. Probably the most on the roster. Um, and then uh, Keyshawn Williams is also another guy who can return kicks, but he did he did mostly kickoffs um, as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, special teams seems to be in a good spot. Grant Kane um, is somebody who is kind of a dark horse on this staff. Um, so and as a special teams coordinator. So I think, you know, I think. Uh, I, you know, it's it's special teams is probably one of those things that it probably transfers more so than other as far as like talent level goes from different levels, it probably transfers more so than other positions uh, because it is, there's so much reliant on physical skill right. and, uh, and, you know, you're, you're catching punts and kickoffs and, um, and, and field goals. It's all kind of the same technique and it's very much uh, singular um, and, and ability. So I, I, I wouldn't expect, I don't have too many concerns about special teams just based off of uh previous performances, which I think they did a really good job bringing guys in. We got a lot more to talk about, but we're not going to do it right now. We're going to do it later. Uh, so we'll have more content coming up for you as we continue to round in. We're going to get Taylor's thoughts, hopefully, before the season starts on on how the season will go. You'll get uh, Scott and I will weigh in. We'll do our normal season game-by-game -game projections, which I, I, uh, I don't know that we've ever, ever – gotten it right so you could just use it to laugh at us as you move forward but uh we'll have all that if you get it right game then we'll have to go in business together <laughs> uh, there you go yeah, that's, right. like that. that's good but no uh taylor layman from bite size bison thank you for joining us always great insights and looking forward to reading you and talking with you throughout the course of the season as we continue to cover this iu football program yeah, thanks for having me on, Galen. and thanks to all of you folks for listening we really appreciate it as always and we'll be back with more on the Back Home Network as we cover IU football and eventually IU basketball, both men's and women's coming up here very soon. For Taylor from Bite Size Bison, I'm Galen Clavio from Crimson Cast saying thanks for joining us here on the show. And thanks to Home Field Apparel, our presenting sponsor. We will catch you folks on the flip side. Bring back the bison. So long, everybody. Mm -hmm.